Welcome to this video where we're going to cover the basics of setting up jobs in LMN time. But wait, before you fast forward this video somewhere in the middle or right to the end or close it down altogether, if you're going to watch any videos in LMN, the jobs videos are the ones you're going to want to watch. Jobs are going to make or break LMN time for you. The way you set up your jobs is going to determine how jobs are tracked, how information ends up in accounting, how easy or hard it is for your staff to track their time and fill out their timesheets. The way you set up jobs is even going to impact your invoicing and what gets charged and what doesn't. Because you're likely to set up a lot of jobs this season, if you're going to spend half an hour to an hour watching videos, these are the ones you're going to want to watch. Make sure you really understand what jobs are, how to set them up, and what you can do with them. And you'll be so glad you did after because you'll save yourself all kinds of rework later. It's far easier to learn this now than it is to learn it after you set up 300 jobs and find out, oh, I wish I did something differently. So with that, let's dive right in. This video will cover just the basics of setting up jobs, so the very surface level stuff. And then in other videos, we'll dive into things like setting up jobs for invoicing and looking at some of the more advanced menus on the job screen. Let's start now with setting up our first job. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to Element Time and we're going to go to the Jobs menu. To add your first job, we're going to go down to the bottom and hit New Job. Now what we're going to do here is add a job from scratch. We also have the ability to import an estimate as a job. And that will save you a lot of time because it will bring in the customer information, the job site information, all the estimated hours. It's great, but we'll cover that in another video. Now you do also have the opportunity to actually take your CRM information and export that as a job as well. It's a far more simplified export, but it is possible. And to do that, you'd go to your CRM and you'd go here to this Create Jobs button. It's a really handy way of creating, say, 100 maintenance jobs for 100 of your maintenance clients. You can do it all at once without setting them up one at a time. But again, we'll cover that in a different video. In this video, we're just gonna cover the basics of how you'd set up a job from start to finish. So at the bottom here, I'm gonna go new job. The first thing it's gonna ask me for is customer or client. So if that customer is already in your system, you can type their name. It'll go find it, just even some portion of their name. And then you click select. And once you click select, You'll be able to choose from any contacts at that customer and any job sites at that customer if that customer has multiple job sites. Over here on the right hand side is where you've got your type of job that you're creating, the name of the job you're creating, the short name, and the short name is what's going to show up for the cruise, and then you've got your customer information here. And that's all read only because it's coming from your CRM. Now what happens if you don't have that customer in your CRM yet, so they're brand new? Well again, we go to new job. And instead of hitting the search, we go over here to new. And this allows me to add a new client or contact on the fly. I can hit OK. What that'll do is save that contact information in our CRM and allow me to move forward with creating a job. For this case, just to be quickly, we'll take an existing client. So your job short name is going to be the name it's going to give this job. In this case, it's not bad, um, this office install. If it's maintenance, I might want to add something like the year to the job name so that it's easier to track a 2017 job versus a 2018 job, but we're close. Now a job short name is limited to 25 characters. And the reason it's that is because we need the crews to be able to see the job names on the phone without scrolling off the side of the screen. 25 characters is about the right size for that. So what you want to do is come up with your job name in 25 characters or less. Well, that will be something that your crew understands. In our company, we typically use the job address. So instead of using the job name, I might use something like this. So it's the address of the job and then the identifier. So install or irrigation or snow. The reason why we put this on the end is so if I do have two jobs for one job site, say it's an install and a maintenance contract, it's not confusing to my crews. It's easy for them to see which ones are which. In fact, even better, if you come up with three letter codes for your divisions, INS for install, IRR for irrigation, SNO for snow jobs, it becomes easy for your crews to see what type it is purely by looking at the name. In this example, we're just gonna do an install contract. So we're gonna keep it simple and we're gonna do install. So we hit okay. 
What that does now is create a job for you in LMN. So by default, the job is active. If you don't want crews to see this on their time cards yet, turn it off. The job will still be there. It won't delete it, but it won't show up for the crews to book time against. So if you're creating jobs that aren't ready yet, or your job is finished and you don't want to show it to your crews anymore, we turn that off. But because it's a new job, I'll probably leave it on. Now I've got my job name and my short name. So again, that's the name of the job that shows up here in the application. This is the name of the job that's going to show up on the crew's phone. It's limited to 25 characters. I did pick the job type on the last screen, but if you need to change it, you can do so here. Over on the right hand side is the jobs link to the CRM. A couple handy things you can ask me to do here. Let's say I picked the wrong client. If I click the client name here, it allows me to change the contact, change the job site, or even change the whole client. If I click that, I can actually search for a different client, pick them, and that gets picked. So that's how you might change a client if you have made a mistake. Uh, I also might want to view this client in CRM. Let's say I'm working with them and I want to look up a note or something about the client. I can just click the binoculars here. What that'll do is open a new tab and it opens that client in my CRM. So I'll have all their general information and files and communication history and anything else I may have entered about that client. Back to here. Um, we've got the job address set up that came from CRM. The latitude and longitude will be automatically calculated for you. But it does come editable. So if you're working at like a large university, uh, military facility, airport, campus, something like that, you can actually, instead of getting the latitude and longitude to the address, that's a way what we're going to default it as. That's all the information we know. You could go right to Google Maps, right click on any building or parking lot, and you can get a really specific latitude and longitude. So if you're dealing with really large sites, that's a way of um, zooming in even further to the correct GPS. But by default, for most of your sites, it'll automatically get the address for you. If you want to create links for your jobs, that'll show up in Element Time, and they're basically URLs that you can put in there. For example, some people use Dropbox to store files. So if I want to put a link to that job's Dropbox folder, I can do that here. When my crews are out in the field, they can click that link and they can get access to that Dropbox provided that they have uh, the permission to do so. That's the main field, really easy to set up. Most of that work got set up for you when you, um, when you set up the job on the last screen. Notes are internal notes only. They're not gonna show up for the crews here. There's another spot for that, but it'll allow me to just make some notes about the job, things I may wanna remember. The group allows me to add this uh, job to different groups. So let's say, for example, this is an install job, and I wanna add this job to my group of install jobs. I'm gonna go down here to add to groups. I'm gonna add it to my all install jobs, and I'll click okay. Now that job belongs to that group. Really handy for maintenance and snow companies that are doing routing. At this point in time, I could add that job to a group that represents a route. Payroll settings allows me to override the default payroll settings. So we talked about that in the settings payroll codes. By default, your jobs are gonna be set up with your normal payroll codes. However, if this job, for example, insisted we pay prevailing wage to our staff, I could override the payroll codes on this job with my prevailing wage codes. So what that would mean is anytime crews book time against this job, we would override their normal rate of pay with prevailing wages, but only for time booked on this job. Really handy if you're doing work in snow and wages or prevailing wage, like we said. But we'll just set these back to the default for now, because for an install job, it's probably gonna be like that 95% of the time. You won't have to change that unless you need to. Job files allow me to upload files for this job. So let's say, for example, I wanted the crews to be able to see some photos of this job site and maybe even uh, some locates. So I can either link those files from CRM if I've already uploaded them. In this case, I haven't. So I could go upload files. So I'll click that. We're gonna find our folder with the pictures or things we wanna set up. I'll grab this map and maybe I'll grab a uh, uh, some locates and I'll hit OK and that will then upload those files to this job. So this feature is available to pro users only, not basic, but for pro users, what's going to happen now is your crew out in the field has access to these files. So they could look at sitemaps, they could look at, uh, let's say you wanted to upload your job planner so that they would have all their material and equipment lists. Um, locates are a fantastic example, that way your crew will never get caught without uh, underground locates on their phone. Lots of good uses for this. Now let's get into the time tracking part of setting up a job. We're gonna to go to clock in tasks. 
So clock in tasks are the ways I want to track time against this job. We could do it really simply. We could just create, for example, one task called install. Now by doing this, all the different stuff I do on this job will just all be tracked under install. So I really won't know how much time we spend on the front yard or the backyard or for the hardscapes or softscapes, but it sure makes it super easy for the crews to clock in. All they do is pick this job. And if you just have one task, it'll automatically clock them into this task. Most companies like to start this way. It's actually a great way to get your crews warmed up to the system. So rather than really trying to break their time down by micromanaging every portion of the job, which is where a lot of companies go to even right off the bat, we start simple. Even if we just knew exactly how many hours we spent on a job, estimated versus actual, if you knew that on every job and you knew it in real time, you'd be ahead of 98% of your competition. You can end up breaking this down further, and we're going to show you how to do that in one second. But for those of you just getting started with the system, it's probably a really good idea to keep these tasks as simple as possible while you're getting started. Let your crews get used to them. It's so much easier six, eight, 10 weeks later to introduce a little more breakdowns to your crews because by that time they'll have got the hang of all the basics. It'll be no problem. They'll know how to clock in and clock out. Then you can start introducing a little bit more tracking. Get started, keep it simple. However, you can be as complicated or as simple as you like. So for example, you got task name install. We're gonna set up the cost code. What the cost code does is when we book time against this job, it's gonna book those hours to this cost code in accounting. So it's especially important for those who are syncing this with QuickBooks or another uh, external system where you wanna track time to divisions or profit centers. So any work done against this install task will not only go to this job in QuickBooks, but it'll also go to our installation cost code or profit center. It's a service item in QuickBooks is what it actually gets linked to. Task notes. We mentioned earlier, you can set up notes on the job. If you want your crews to see notes when they clock in. So if I want to know, you know, don't forget to lock the fence when you leave. I can add that note in here. And what'll happen is every time the crew clocks in, any crew clocks into this task, they're gonna get that note. And that way there's no excuse that they missed something or forgot something or whatever. You know that they saw it when they clocked into the job. That way too, if I send a different crew that doesn't usually go to that job, they're gonna get that note too. So I don't have to remember to tell that new crew any of the small uh, things that make a difference for the customer. Track hours and rates for billing by the hour is what I would turn on if this task was billed hourly. So if I was gonna do this install work and I had agreed to the client to charge them 55 an hour for install work, that's what I would turn on. Typically though, you're working with contract prices and that would be off. So you can do it either way. Um, if you want to show a list of materials or activities on Clockout, we'll turn that on. If not, we'll turn it off. So for install, you're probably not gonna set up much materials or activities. Uh, so it doesn't really matter whether it's on or off. For maintenance, when we're actually asking, did you complete these services or did you use these materials? It becomes really important because it saves the crew a step. If there's a certain task out there that we don't track services or materials on, we can turn this off for that task and that way we don't bother the crew with extra questions they don't need to answer. Exclude from overtime. Now on normal jobs, you'll never turn this on. It'll always be off because you'll always factor the job for overtime. However, if you're tracking paid sick time or paid vacation time in LMN and those times aren't eligible for overtime, then when I create a job called shop or unbillable, and I create a task called sick pay or paid holidays, I can turn that on so that it doesn't count those hours towards the employee's weekly overtime. 95% of the time, that's gonna be off because it's a job and you owe them overtime if they work on it. But for anything that doesn't have included in overtime calculations, you can turn it on. Hide from timesheets means we're done this task, don't show it anymore. It's not like you have to come in and do that every time you finish a task, but if you do do it, it just makes the crew simpler. So for example, if I wanted to, at the end of my spring cleanup season, hide my spring cleanup tasks, just so they don't show up every day anymore, that's how I'd do it. I would put on hide from timesheets. It's still there, all the time has been tracked against it and all that's still there, but the crews don't see it day to day because it's now hidden from timesheets. Then the last field is estimated man hours. So if there was a uh, hundred hours worth of work estimated for this task, um, I just put that in there. For install work, we're not really too concerned about the number of visits. It may take us two or three days, but it's really one 
uh, attack at the task. So we leave that at one. If it's mowing, uh, then maybe this might be 38 visits or 32 visits, wherever you're from. And then it'll come up with an average time per visit. In this case, it's install. So we have our first task in there. It's install. Now you might be asking yourself, well, why are change orders showing up in there? How did they get there automatically? We covered that in the settings. If I go back here and I go to settings and I look at default tasks, we've set up a default task for install work called change orders to get added to every job. So when I created that job for the first time, because I have a default task called change orders, that task automatically got set up for me when I created this job. So if you didn't want that, obviously you just go back into settings, delete that default task, and then that would never happen again. But that's why that is in there. So now I have two tasks for the job. And what's gonna happen is when crews go to clock in, they're gonna clock into this job, and then they will get a choice. Are you working on install work or change orders? And then we're gonna track and manage their time accordingly. Now, you can make this as detailed as you want. If you wanna to get to a point where you're gonna track hardscapes versus softscapes, well, we could add those as tasks as well. Maybe you'd get rid of this one because that's, that's a sum of all of it. But now I'd have hardscapes, softscapes, and change orders. Again, crew would go to site, they'd hit clock in, they would be given those choices. If you wanted to track front hardscapes versus back hardscapes, front softscapes versus back softscapes, you could do that as well. In fact, there's no limit to the number of tasks you can have. But there is a limit to the number of tasks that your crews can actually use. To expect that your crews are gonna pull out their phone every 10 minutes to switch the tasks that they're working on is untenable, and you'll probably find it won't work. You wanna keep this simple enough for the crews to use and informative enough for you to use to look back on it and figure out where you're estimating correctly and where you're not. But don't try to get too detailed. Uh, probably the biggest mistake most companies make when they get started with LMN time is trying to get too detailed on the clock in task. They want so much information that they forget. The foreman out in the field is trying to manage the work getting done, it's being done right, there's four people running around, the equipment's broken, the likelihood of them remembering to pull out their phone every time somebody on their crew switches a task is not that great. So we wanna keep the task simple, not too detailed. Um, as I said earlier in the video, the longer you use element time, the more detailed you can get because your crews are used to using it, especially when you get started. It's really important you keep this as simple as possible. In fact, I often advocate, just start with one task. Just keep it really simple. Just know estimated versus actual on the whole job. And once your crews get the hang of it, then you can start adding more and more tasks to jobs and give them a little bit more responsibility for tracking their time. And as far as the basics go, that's all you need to know. What we just set up there is enough information to have crews come into the job and track their time accordingly and export all that info, uh, information for payroll. Crews can track their time to a job. They can pick which task. The task will determine which cost code in accounting that time and the cost of that time get booked to. And that's about it. At the end of the job, you'll be able to go view progress. Obviously, we have no time against this job. We just created it. But if I go back here and I open a job that's existing, so this one, for instance, and I go to view progress, here I can see what percent of the job that we've completed, estimated versus actual hours. Here's my total estimated, here's my total actual. And then it starts to break those hours down by task. And the amazing thing about this is it's live, like it's real time. As I'm looking at this, I know as of this minute, we've used up 18 out of 149 hours. For those, and if my crews are on this job today, and I check back at this half an hour later, I'll see these numbers changing. So you'll never have to wait or generate or enter data for a report again. It happens automatically. Now, for those of you interested in some of the features down here as we get into invoicing and scheduling and photos, we're gonna cover those in the jobs advanced video. So tune into that video to see what you can do, especially if you're a service or a snow company, we're gonna get into how to track services on this job and how to set those services up for invoicing so they're billed correctly. Join us in the advanced video for that. Any questions setting up your jobs, hit us up on email at advice at goelemn.com or use the chat window in the top right hand corner of LMN or check us out at goelmn.com slash help where you'll find our help center. And there's all sorts of frequently asked questions, articles and videos there where you can get answers to your questions without having to wait at all. Thanks for watching.